Good morning and welcome to this second part of the lecture on plasmon resonances in metal nanoparticles. Here we will afford some more advanced topics such as surface plasmon polaritons in metallic thin films and quantum corrections to the coupling of metal nanoparticles. In the previous lecture we have seen that longitudinal electronic waves can be excited at the plasma frequency omega p, where omega p is the natural frequency of the oscillation of the free electron c. The birth of plasmonics can be dated in 1957, when Rufus Ricci discovered that when exciting metallic films with electrons, together with the bulk plasmons, it was possible to excite at quite slower energy, some other, ener some other plasmonic modes, and these modes were attributed to surface plasmons, that is, resonant states of the light with the surface. Under suitable experimental conditions, it is possible to couple light between the surface at the surface between a metal and the dielectric, in a so-called surface plasmon polariton mode. What is important is that when light couples to this surface mode, the electromagnetic field is confined in the z direction at distance of the order of few hundreds of nanometers on the side of the dielectric and of few tens of nanometers in the side of the metal. When a surface plasmon polariton wave is excited, the electromagnetic wave is confined at the metal dielectric interface. The electromagnetic wave and charge oscillation interact in a sort of combined mode that propagates along the surface. The solution of this problem can be obtained using Maxwell's equations, and what is discovered is that light propagates along this mode with a wave vector that is proportional to omega over c times the square root of epsilon 1 epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 where epsilon 1 is the medium of the dielectric is the dielectric constant of the dielectric while epsilon 2 is the dielectric constant of the metal in order to launch a surface plasma polariton wave two conditions must be fulfilled the first is that the electric field must be in the plane the second deals with the dispersion relation kx equal to k0 square root of epsilon 1 epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 that is plotted here in this solid black line. As shown in the plots, the dispersion relation of a free propagating field, that is this dotted solid line here, doesn't touch the dispersion relation of the plasma. This means that with a free propagating field, we will never be able to couple light into the SPP wave. In order to do this, in order to couple light into a surface, surface plasma polariton wave, we need to exploit some specific configurations that are the Otto configuration and the Kretschmann configuration. In these two configurations, instead of exciting directly and shining directed light onto the metallic film, we use an evanescent wave. The evanescent wave in this case is generated at the surface between a glass prism and the hair, and then in the near field we put the metallic film, and this is the auto configuration. While in a more easy way we can deposit directly the film, the metallic film, on top of the uh, prism, glass prism, and in this case we can excite directly the surface plasma polariton through the evanescent wave that generates at the surface between the glass and the, meta and the metal. These two specific configurations, and in particular the evanescent wave, are needed in order to provide the additional momentum that permits us to bend the light propagation curve and have a condition in which the optical field matches the dispersion of the surface plasma polariton. At this angle here, we will be able to launch the surface plasma polariton wave. And this requires, as we have seen, some evanescent wave to match, to, to add some extra momentum to the optical field. From the experimental point of view, in order to launch a surface plasma polariton wave, 
We deposit metal gold film on top of a glass prism. Then we send a laser beam at a certain angle. This angle must fulfill the condition here, the total internal reflection condition, so that on the side of metallic of the metallic uh, film we will have an evanescent wave. Changing this angle, we will see that the reflected light will be somehow constant, but at a certain point when we match the plasma disp the, 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 the dispersion relation, when the K of the field matches the K, the wave, the wave vector of source of plasma polariton, some light will be injected into the metallic field. This means that the light that is reflected will, will have a smaller intensity. You see in this curve. In this curve, at this angle, theta zero, we are matching the resonance condition. When the field is, when, when, when uh, the, 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 the condition is fulfilled, we see that the field in the hair and in the metal is like this. So there is some field inside the metal, while outside of this resonance condition, the field is all on the hair and is not in the metal. Since the wave vector of the surface plasma and polariton wave both depends on the dielectric constant of the metal and of the environment, we can use this relation for sensing, in the sense that if we change somehow the dielectric constant of the medium surrounding the metallic field, we expect the angle at which the SPP wave is launched to change. So, for example, if our surface is coated with some bioreceptor and then the bioreceptor binds some molecules, the binding of these molecules will cause a change of the dielectric constant of the surrounding medium. And this will have an effect on the angle at which the SPP is launched. This is a typical plot in which here, in the red curve, we do not have any binding of the analyte on the surface, but when the analyte binds on the surface, this causes a shift of the surface plasma polariton curve, and this shift, and in particular, the change of signal at this point, can be used to sense and to prove that some analyte has bound to our bioreceptor. So surface plasma polariton sensors can be made, and these are nowadays commercial. In this second part of the lecture, we will look at some quantum effects that occur when metal nanoparticles come close together at distances in which tunneling of electrons can occur. We have seen in the previous lecture that the close encounter of two metal nanoparticles can be described using the plasma hybridization model. Here, the dipoles associated to each nanoparticle interact, giving rise to a high energy mode that is dark since it has zero net dipolar moment and does not couple to the electromagnetic field, and the low energy mode that has non zero net dipolar moment and so it couples to the electromagnetic radiation being visible in extinction spectra. This bright mode is also called the bonding dimer plasmon, in analogy to the bonding state in molecular hybridization pictures. In this picture, each nanoparticle remains neutral, and the closer we set their distance, the more redshifted will be the energy of the bright mode. A strong electromagnetic field is expected at the nanocavity at the junction between these two metal nanoparticles. Decreasing the distance, when the two metal nanoparticles come in touch with each other, the electrons will start moving from one particle to another in a free way. The charges will therefore oscillate among the two nanoparticles, and as soon as we shrink the distance between the metal nanoparticle, we will observe a blue shift of the energy mode as a consequence of the fact that the total the dimension of the particle will be smaller and smaller. 
There is an intermediate region, however, in which narrow junctions take place of the order of one nanometer or below, in which tunneling between non one nanoparticle and the other can occur. This regime, of course, cannot be described by classical electromagnetism, but requires a quantum mechanical description. At very short distances, typically smaller than one nanometer, tunneling occurs. Tunneling is a sort of spill-out of electrons from a single nanoparticle that goes to the other, and vice versa. The classical theory is, of course, not capable to explain tunneling effects. Theoretical models like time-dependent density functional theory can explain tunneling, but calculations are numerical and time-consuming, and therefore limited to few electrons. In 2012, the group of Javier Aispurua came up with the idea of describing tunneling with a dielectric constant that depends on the gap between the two nanoparticles. This leads to some analytical models that can therefore be applied for calculations and compared to experiments. In the quantum mechanical picture, the system is described by two metallic particles of the electric constant epsilon m immersed in a dielectric of constant epsilon zero. The junction between the two nanoparticles is modeled with a dielectric constant epsilon, that is function of the length and of the incident frequency of the electromagnetic field omega. Electrons can tunneling through the junction with a probability T of L. The dielectric constant of the junction is calculated starting from the Drude model. Here it is introduced the gap-dependent tunneling dump dumping coefficient, gamma g of L, at the denominator, that in turn is inversely proportional here to a DC conductivity factor that is related to the amount of electrons that tunnel through the junction. The DC conductivity or tunneling conductivity, in turn, is proportional to an energy-dependent tunneling pro probability, T, that is function of the energy, omega, and of the junction width, L, integrated all over the energies from zero to the Fermi level. With these assumptions, the Drew determined the junction of the junction dielect dielectric constant plays a role only when tunneling occurs. As shown in this figure, the tunneling probability and the associated tunneling conductivity rapidly goes to zero when the junction length exceeds few angstroms. As a consequence, the tunneling damping here increases by several orders of magnitude when the particle separation goes over the tunneling regime, few angstroms, making the root term in epsilon m totally negligible. An experimental verification of these quantum effects has been carried out looking at two metal nanoparticles grown at the apex of two atomic force microscopy tips that are approached to each other while observing at the scattering. The particles have been approached starting from a distance d larger than the quantum regime in which there is some near field interaction that causes a slight shift of this plasma resonance, then they arrive to a region in which the quantum regime is achieved. In this condition, quantum tunneling, electron tunneling, occurs between the two nanoparticles. And then the, the, the two particles are further approached down to contact, where contact and electronic conduction occurs between the two metal nanoparticles. As can be observed here, some new modes, some charge transfer modes, occur and are visible in the, in the scattering spectrum. In this plot here, 
we observe that while in the classical theory a continuous redshift of all the modes is expected down to d equal to zero, this is not the case in the experiment, and that the experiment is very well reproduced by the quantum theory, which predicts some intermediate region in which some tunneling occurs and a charge transfer mode when the two particles keep in touch.